thank you all for being here again. Uh, I hope space is a little bit tight, but you all found, found a good place to sit. Um, just a quick announcement, because we are a little bit late with the time, um, but I think that pauses are really important. So we will stay with the time schedule and uh, be speaking until five. So it's a little bit shorter our panel. I hope this is okay for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. My name is Miriam Shukri. I was already kindly introduced, and I'm really honored to share. I'm sorry to share this first and really important panel on post-colonial memory culture and restorative justice, why today? And um, first of all, let me introduce our honored guests. I would like to start to introduce um, Ida Hoffman, who is sitting right on the second chair there. Um, and Ida is the chairperson of the Nama Genocide Technical Committee and uh, a German genocide justice activist in Namibia for more than 20 years. So, uh, and she's currently a member of the parliament as well, of the Republic of Namibia, and also previously served as a parliamentarian from 2005 to 2010. And she is a very renowned speaker, activist, panelist, and speaks regularly on various platforms uh, such as the Pan-Africanism Congress in Munich in 2014. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. So, um, and secondly, I would um, like to um, present here Israel Kanyakike here sitting in the middle. And um, he's born in Namibia and a hero activist based in Berlin, here in Germany. And he f uh, is part of the group and also formed the group um, Völkermord verjährt nicht, nur Amnesty for Genocide. Again, thank you for being here. Um, then I, to my right side, uh, I would like to present to you Joy Alamazan. Uh, Joy uh, is a project manager um, for the education program in the federal states of Baden-Württemberg and Bavaria for Engagement Global. And um, Engagement Global is an institution for, from the Federal Ministry of Economy, Cooperation and Development and responsible for the promotion and uh, civic and political education and development politics and municipal uh, development of Germany. Thank you for coming out. <laughs> and uh, on the other side of the panel, I would like to present to you Kwesi Eikens. Um, he is teaching at the University of Kassel, a political scientist, human rights activist. He works on issues of decolonizing public space and shifting the perspectives on the German colonialism for the last 17 years, so also for a very long time. For example, he um, was part in the renaming of the former Gröbenufer in Berlin, uh, that is now called Meyerim Ufer. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here. <laughs> and last, but of course not least, uh, I would like to present to you Esther Munyenge. She is the chair person of the Overheru Over Mamderu Genocide Foundation in Namibia and uh, uh, is a social worker and teaching at the University of Namibia. And she is a leading community activist here uh, in Namibia and for the course of the Herrera people. It's an honor to have you here. After this quick introduction, I would now like to give the word to our panelists because it's not me that should be speaking here. 
and um, therefore I would like our panelists to give each a brief entry okay. statement to our pa leading panel question that you see up there, post-colonial memory culture and restor uh, restorative justice, why today? And um, first I would like to ask Ida if you could start with your entry statement. Thank you, thank you very much. I am the leader of the outstanding, the leader of the outstanding program, organizers of the program, panelists, ladies and gentlemen. I am truly honored to be part of this unique event here today and so share with you Namibia and Germany's unresolved business of the Nama and the Herero genocide in Namibia. Germany left Namibia in house and destructions with so much unfinished business of injustice and broad inequalities across the country. As the previous ruling nation over Namibia, Namibia has been dumped into unfold misery, poverty, disruptions, dysfunction, and political confusion. Germany left Namibia with so many damages to attend to and so put right what the Germans have destroyed. Yes, indeed. Our priority then as Namibians before independence was to first gain our freedom and to speak and act freely as an independent people from a position of power. It was a wise decision to first develop the power base we have today and to speak from that independent power base, which today is the sovereign self-governing Namibia. And yes, we have taken up the issue of genocide justice immediately after independence with all seriousness. In fact, we already started to make strides way back in 1992. 1991, this issue, which me, Ida Hoffman, wrote the first letter to the father, father, the father of the nation, President Sen Noyoma. I want to speak to him, and I did it. Yes. Since then, genocide justice fight has grown from strength to strength. Before that, it was one of the most unheard of issues all across Namibia. Today, it is the issue that occupies attention of a huge number of Namibians. Yes, we have come a long way. You will recall the Namibian Parliament 2006 resolution of the Namibian National Assembly on the genocide by Germany in Namibia. That is very powerful and a strong platform for genocide justice fight in Namibia. And every way this genocide justice is fought. We haven't stopped for a single moment to fight for genocide justice since we started and we will not pause for a single moment until justice is done. Post-colonial memory culture and restorative justice. Why today? Today, we are a free country, a free people, a free nation. And today, our fight for restorative justice is part of our guests for nation building and nationhood. Today, we are building our nation, and yes, our country, and yes, indeed, our people have been laid waste by Germany, who took Namibia and Namibians 
on a destructive journey of oppression. Then handed it over to the apartheid South Africa and continue abuse. We fought our way out of that bondage too. Indeed, prior to our independence, Namibia was at war and conflict situation for the most past. Why restorative justice now? Now is the right time. We have fought our, uh, our other battles and wars, and we have won them. We prepare our way for this yet another major battle of restorative justice. Even so, as we, the genocide justice activists, are fighting diligently against the Nama and the Herero genocide perpetrators, those who betrayed our trust and massacred our people. They are reactionaries forces. Some are totally against our actions and objectives for the genocide justice. Some claim gains our campaign has brought about so far. Other denounce, denounce us who have brought this fight to this point. We have to and are facing these forces with courage, both there in Germany and Namibia and elsewhere. At this point in time, we have engaged the descendants and as victims of this genocide in Namibia in a first of its kind court case in the United States. And we are determined to fight until justice is done. And shockingly, there are more forces in our midst trying to destroy our gains in the struggle. We are dealing both with the Namibian government and the German government. There is the so-called German Special Initiative, which has not yet been recalled after it has already been discredited. Both these governments have the so-called Special Anyway programs and deal with the genocide problems, but are not moving the issue forward. Both are mistaken. Yet another tony issue is Namibia government has put 400 billion Namibian dollars price on genocide reparation to be paid by the German government, not to the victims of the restorations, but to the Namibian government. Let me underline justice must be done to the victims of those horrible massacres of 1904, 1908 and beyond. The objectives and demands are within the primary objectives of justice. The round table, apology, acknowledgement, repatriation of all human remains, reparation, restoration, reconciliation. Post-colonial memory, culture, and restorative justice. Why today? Because the victims of that terrible genocide distractions are still suffering. Every generation of the victims left behind by the genocide, genocide destruction is still subject to this curse. Reparation must be done. Germany doesn't have a choice. Before independence, Namibia had very little chance to breathe and live and, to, uh, and be alive politically, economically, socially, religiously, culturally, and otherwise. There was a regime of total control over every aspect of life of Namibians. It was the South African apartheid regime. And as a people, Namibians were fighting on all fronts for dignity exercises under conditions of total control by successive foreign powers. Even justice to mention about the genocide during the South African regime in Namibia that preceded a free and independent Namibia would have had you ending up in prison for a very long time. For you to insist the reparation which included length 
restitution would have been unthinkable back then. A terrible crime has been committed, justice must not be omitted. Victims have been left behind, justice must be done. Germany has done a human deed of Namibia and her world genocide. Germany must face justice. The victims of German destructions must be vindicated. Post-colonial memory, culture, and restorative justice. Why today? Because today is the right time. The victims of the genocide are still under damages and injuries of the genocide destructions. Organizers and leaders, participants of this distinguished program, I thank you. Ida. Yeah, Israel, you already have the microphone in your hand. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, ich, ich heiße Israel Kamasuka. Ich bin von der Bündnis Volker Erstmal bedanke ich mich bei den Organisatoren. Es war großartig. Also, das war eine super Organisation. Wir sind alle sehr zufrieden, auch meine Landsleute. Und was wir auch, auch in Hamburg überhaupt so erlebt haben, ob das in der Volkerkundemuseum oder Ethnologischen Museum oder Universität, wo wir auch alle diese Objekte gesehen haben, zum Beispiel, was äh, emotional war, war, als wir den Schädel äh, in der Uni äh, gesehen haben. Das war für uns einfach ein trauriger äh, Blick, weil, weil das ist wie ob man ein Opa oder Großvater trifft, der irgendwie so einsam, irgendwo einsam da liegt, einsam in irgendwelche Keller versteckt war, entführt war, äh, gefoltert. Äh, es ist, äh, als wir gesehen haben, ob wir, ob wir wirklich jemanden vielleicht äh, befreit haben, ein Uronkel und so, das ist ein, es war so eine traurige äh, ähm, Begegnung, ich, ich werde das nie vergessen. Wir haben fast alle geweint, weil das ist, und das hat mit dem Genozid zu tun. Und da kann man auch niemals sagen, es war nie eine Genozid. Das war eine Genozid, das war Völkermord. Und, und wir haben, ich möchte einfach nur einfach noch dazu ergänzen, weil was Ida gesagt hat, das ist auch was ich vorhabe zu sagen, aber. Es gibt unheimlich viele, äh, wir, wir, wie, wie wir wissen, wir, es wird verhandelt zwischen den zwei Bundes, äh, Bundesrepublik Deutschland und der namibischen Regierung. Das heißt, die verhandeln äh, über uns, aber wir sind nicht in diesem Prozess einbezogen. Was ist, dann frage ich mich, was ist das für ein demokratischer äh, Weg? Das heißt, äh, Erstens ist diese Regierung überhaupt nicht legitimiert, uns zu vertreten. Heute, wir sind hier, wir sehen überhaupt keine namibische Broadcasting Corporation. Die Sachen, die vertreten uns. Wo sind die denn? Wo ist hier in Namibia Fernseher? Gar nichts. Das, das heißt, die soll, äh, darum sagen wir, wer ist der Auskommen aus dieser Verhandlung zwischen diesen zwei Regierungen ist für uns ein totaler Nonsens. Das wird wir nie akzeptieren, solange wir ausgeschlossen sind. Und das haben, das haben wir ein paar Mal haben, haben, haben wir auch gesagt, oder Esther oder Ida. Das war eine Resolution von 2007, eine UNO-Resolution. Die deutsche Regierung hat das auch mit unterschrieben. Aber die rennen weg von der Verantwortung. Aber wir werden die verfolgen bis zu Frau Merkel in sein Büro. Also das heißt, wir, werden, äh, wir, werden, wir sind so stark, es ist 100 Jahre oder mehr als 100 Jahre, wir haben die Apartheid-Staat äh, äh, bekämpft, das Apartheid. Ich habe nie gedacht, dass, ich, dass wir irgendwann frei wären. Ich, hab, ich bin mit 17 Jahren, habe ich Namibia äh, verlassen. Ich war eine Befreiungsbewegung. Ja, bis ich irgendwann... Vielleicht, es hat mich irgendwie geführt, dass du musst nach Berlin, nach Westberlin. 
Und äh, das war vielleicht, das war vielleicht äh, die Menschen oder die, äh, die Gebeine oder die, die, die hier sind, die mich gerufen haben, vielleicht gehen wir nach Berlin und kämpfen unsere Rechte und kämpfen, dass wir wieder zurückkommen nach Hause, dass wir überführt werden nach Hause. Das haben wir auch geschafft 2011. Wir, wir, haben, wir, wir haben damals 2004, ich und mein Freund äh, Martin Bär, einen Film gedreht zu 100-jähriges äh, Gedenktag der Genozid in Namibia. Ja. Und diese ganze Sachen hat mich total, äh, als ich erfahren habe, dass hier in Deutschland äh, Volkermord, wir haben damals auch nicht so in der Schule mitbekommen, in Namibia, in Deutschland auch genauso. Und das habe ich mich verpflichtet zu sagen, ich werde dafür mich einsetzen. Ich bin vielleicht die einzige Herrero in Berlin. Das ist ohne mich mit meinen Freunden von Postkolonial und, und initiative Straßen, Menschen, die uns auch in diese Revolution, in diese Revolution, in diese Revolution kommen noch. In, diese, in, in unserem Kampf um das TUS und wir sind so stark und, äh, äh, und ich sehe auch diese ganze Resonanz hier, äh, äh, das gibt uns, das motiviert uns und das motiviert mich und meine Freunde und, äh, äh, und wie gesagt, wir sind ausgeschlossen, wir sind, äh, der, es wird immer gerettet von, dass man äh, uns anerkannt hat, Völkermord ist anerkannt, das stimmt gar nicht, es ist nicht nur verbal anerkannt, das ist nicht offiziell anerkannt von der Bundesrepublik Deutschland. Das heißt, wir haben nicht so, was, wir fordern nicht so viel, wir, wir haben nur drei Punkte, was wir fordern von Deutschland. Entschuldigung, Anerkennung und Reparation. Über Reparation können wir irgendwann nochmal reden, wie viel und so weiter. Weil Reparation ist ein großes äh, Paket. Ja? Wenn, wenn wir, wissen, wir, wir wissen schon von der von, 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 von Vernichtungsbefehl, dass man alle das, das Volk der Herrlos und Namas muss vernichtet werden. Und ein Teil von unserem Volk sind damals, oder die mussten damals das Land verlassen. Die sind in verschiedenen Ländern, Südafrika, Botswana, sogar in Angola. Und die mussten irgendwann auch nach Hause. Und dafür brauchen wir auch, das ist auch in diesem Reparationpaket, wie man so, ich kann auch so, so sagen. Weil wir werden immer gefragt, wie viel wollt ihr haben? Ich, ich will gar kein Geld haben. Es gibt kein individuelles Geld oder persönliches Geld, was hier ähm, Herrn Pollens äh, immer hier durch die Gegend erzählt oder in Pressekonferenz oder her der Kommandeur in, in, in Windhoek, Herrn Schlager. Ja. Und, äh, äh, und das wollen wir alles nicht. Wir wollen, dass unsere Menschen, die irgendwo da leben, in Südafrika, in, Namibia, in, in Botswana, wieder irgendwann zurückgehen. Aber wo, wo, wo wollen die dann hin? Das Land ist doch immer noch in den deutschen Händen, in den deutschen Nachbarnhänden. Über 70 Prozent, kann man sich vorstellen, über 70 Prozent von einem namibischen Land, äh, äh, Farmland oder Land, wo die Herreros, die damals gewonnen haben, ist nicht mehr da, ist besetzt, immer noch besetzt. Wir sind nicht frei. Es ist totaler Quatsch zu hören, dass Namibia ein freies Land ist. Das, ist, das stimmt nicht. Wir haben eine, eine äh, provisorische Demokratie. Ja? Als vor der Unabhängigkeit Namibia, als diese Verfassung geschrieben wurde, äh, über Landreform, zum Beispiel willige äh, Käufer, Willige Verkäufer und so weiter. Was soll das für ein Quatsch? Ja, wer hat das geschrieben? Das heißt, wir haben vor der Unabhängigkeit so eine Verfassung geschrieben und die Bundesrepublik Deutschland war auch be 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 beteiligt an dieser Verfassung. Wir haben extra so gemacht, um ihre Landsleute zu schützen. Genscher war auch dabei. Es, es ist traurig, wenn ich in Windhoek bin, ich sehe da Genscher Straße. Was soll das überhaupt für ein, für ein Quatsch? Ja. Ja. Und, äh, und, äh, und darum sage ich, dass wir haben einen lang, langen Kampf vor uns. Aber es ist nicht fünf vor zwölf, das ist fünf nach zwölf. Was machen wir um halb eins? <lacht> ja, was machen wir dann um halb eins? Das kann zu spät sein. Aber 
äh, der Sieg ist auf unserer Seite, ob man will oder nicht. Wir wissen, wo Namibia ist, wir wissen, wo unser Land ist, wir wissen, wo unsere Vorfahren gelebt haben. Teilweise, wenn wir die auch befreien, die hier sind, die irgendwo in, in Charitäen, in irgendwelchen Kliniken sind. Aber ich bin wirklich äh, so froh, dass sind auch Universitäten sind, wie wo, wo wir auch gestern waren, die sehr offen sind. Und die gibt mir wirklich unheimlich Mut, dass die anderen Universitäten in Deutschland, die mussten wirklich diese gute Beispiele, die ich, ich bin wirklich froh und ich bedanke mich bei den Professoren, die uns gestern äh, äh, der, der Landsmann uns gezeigt haben in einer eine Uni ähm, Eppendorf, glaube ich war das. Äh, herzlichen Dank an diese zwei äh, Professoren. Unser Kampf geht weiter. Und wir werden gewinnen, ob Sie wollen oder nicht, Frau Merkel, Herrn Pollens, Herrn Keinkopf oder Präsident Keinkopf, wir, sind, wir werden euch jagen. Danke. Um, yes, thank you for this. I would now ask uh, you, Joy, to, to... Yeah, you can use this one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I would like to just say thank you for making it possible for me to be part of this panel. Um, it's an honor for me to sit uh, next to my aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters to discuss such an important topic. Like you said, <coughs> I'm working with um, Engagement Global and our focus is on political education. When I look at political education, and I have to go back to the topic, post-colonial memory culture and restorative justice, why today? The question is, why not today? When then? Um, I had, uh, in my university days, I was fortunate to come in contact with a professor in India. And he saw a presentation that I had in a conference, and he said, Joy, can you prepare that for me for my next book as a chapter? I said, don't worry, I will start tomorrow. He said, Joy, you cannot start tomorrow. There is, you don't walk in a tomorrow, so you have to start today. So you cannot do it tomorrow, because you don't live in tomorrow. So why not today? We cannot do it tomorrow, we don't live in tomorrow, we only live in today. I hope you understand the sense in that. So, um, when we go back now to the aspect of colonial memory, um, Sister Esther Mwenjanki said something very important. She said, there is transgenerational trauma. And if we look at causes and effect, there is also transgenerational responsibility. Okay. <clears throat> so now we have to look at what is our responsibility. If um, the memory is very important, when I heard of the me memory, post-colonial memory culture, I just thought of my little son who runs, who ran next to the table, hurt himself, if there is no memory of what happened, how can he correct that? So we have to be practical and we have to reflect. Now what are we going to do to change this? It is very, very important that um, we start from the basis. What happened during colonialism? Colonialism laid the foundation of racism. Colonialism was based on a picture of a superior Europe to an inferior Africa. And unfortunately, that picture has been transmitted consciously or unconsciously to subsequent generations. Through the kind of way things are done. If you go, I entered a church in Germany. There was a statue. There was a statue of somebody and in front of that statue, there was a small collector where you can, small container to drop money to help the poor. That statue was made in the image of a black man. Now, what happens? 
when the child comes in and seen, sees that, the, the collection was to help people in Germany, not the black men. The child comes in and sees that. The picture of poverty of that child is the black man. Okay, so these are things that have been passed on to, from generation to generation. We have a socialization process which is based on a racial foundation. So we must do something, the reverse, to make sure that the opposite happens. So we have to reconstruct history. We have to look, we have been talking now for how many years about universal human rights. Unfortunately, because of this picture in our head, this human rights has not been realized. They, they are in double, in double standards. Spe rights f for the white people and another level of right for the black people. I don't know if you've heard of the United Nations Decade for People of, of African Descent. Okay, it originated from the Durban Conference because studies have shown that there is segregation, which segregate according to tribes even in our own African countries. But when it comes to the black man, you have multi-level of segregation because of the, color, the skin of his color. And that makes things very difficult. It is so, so disappointing to hear what you have just said. It is the truth. It has not officially been recognized. Now, have you, have you heard of Turkey and the Kurds? You know, Turkey has had tension with Germany today because Germany is insisting that you should recognize this as a genocide. And then here in Germany, you are not recognizing that as a genocide. So that just tells us how we view the world. Who are those we treat in a particular way? And that is why we, we need this post-colonial memory. But it has to be in a critical way to help, help us correct what was wrong, to help us build humanity. And we have to look at it. We have to start teaching our children, the society, the foundations of humanity. We are talking as human. And that is why in my work, to, what I try to focus on is to use this from the point of view of human. Because we see, I was very happy when I had my colleagues, when I just joined Engagement Global. They said, what do we do? They said, well, our work should help us contribute to global justice and to education. So when I look at, I saw the United Nations Agenda 2030, and there was an aspect on the fourth goal, which is uh, inclusive education. They insist that education is not just being able to read and write. Education has to go beyond reading and writing. That is, global citizenship has to be formed through the right kind of education. And global, when we talk of citizenship, we know what we mean. It's, uh, you have your rights, you also have what your responsibilities, but you know what you expect the government to do. You know that if the car is running next to your street very fast, you can mobilize your neighbors and say the, the, the municipality has to put speed brakes because you have children. Now, this responsibility has to be transformed to the global level so much so that when we see things going wrong in Namibia, in uh, Cameroon, we all act here for justice because all of these things are related. What is happening in Namibia, what is happening in many African countries have a relation with Germany, be it from the uh, economic level. So education is very important and we have to think as global citizen because at the end of the day, we are humans. The color of our skin doesn't matter. We keep saying that, but unfortunately, we just say words. We don't mean what we are saying. So we have post-colonial memory has to help us mean what we are saying because we understand it, and it has to start from educating our children and ourselves. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Joy. And I would now like to ask Crazy to speak. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I would like to start by thanking once again the chiefs, members of parliament, the members of the Nubian delegation um, for being here um, and helping us to really um, remember and you know um, 
recognize our responsibility. Um, because I believe this is the responsibility that we have because it is a shared history. It's a history that we share, and it is a history of violence and dispossession, as we have heard. It is also something that is not uh, something that is past and over. It is something that still shapes um, the reality in Namibia today. And that's why I think uh, that's where you know a certain kind of uh, memory culture comes in. Uh, because it is my belief that it is important for um, more people in Germany to recognize this shared history and to understand how our shared present is the outcome of a history of violence that in Germany is all too often uh, forgotten, ignored, and swept under the rug. And one of the reasons I believe that everyday memory culture and issues of symbols, for example, street names, are helpful in actually addressing this issue is because I believe we have somehow been conditioned to live in a normality whose violent history we're not questioning. And that means today we are still benefiting from structural violence that has been enacted in the past and that enables an uneven, a lopsided, an unjust present. And so, um, and this is something that of course has to do with material culture, it has to do with economic privilege. We heard about the issue of land rights, right? And I want to remember everybody who is sitting in this audience paying taxes in Germany, like I do, that um, this also means that we are still enmeshed in that history. We are sponsoring a lot of programs that the German government is running in Namibia including programs that are still sponsoring German culture in Namibia, right? Now the question is, uh, what about Herero and Nama culture? The question is, what about the material basis that enables certain people in Namibia to practice German culture today? And what is our responsibility in regard to this question of unequal land rights that we just heard about. So this is not something that is far away from us. We are all enmeshed in it. But to bring it back to the issue of the symbolical, um, I am active in the context of lobbying for a change of the perspective of commemoration. For example, changing street names. Now, given what you just heard, you might say, well, this might be a side battle. But I want to invite you to connect this issue of post-colonial memory culture to the idea of restorative justice. Because I believe that the battles, the controversies around uh, you know, street names um, actually enable more and more people to come to a different understanding of that history. So when we are uh, lobbying, when we are fighting in public about shifting the perspective of commemoration, I know that this actually enables more and more people to understand what has been hidden from us. For example, I went to school in Germany, and there are certain things that I have not learned, right? And that is why I believe engaging um, these public traces and continuities forces people to actually confront aspects of history that have been hidden from us. And I want to stress that, particularly in Germany, I believe this is important because you know, um, in Germany there's this idea that German identity also hinges on having critically reflected on certain aspects of the past, particularly National Socialism. Now I would say that you cannot understand National Socialism without looking into the colonial past, particularly also into what happened in what is today Namibia. We can never forget that the first German concentration camps were built in what is today Namibia. We should also not forget that some of the racist science that was conducted in these camps during the war enabled people to gain racist expertise, which then allowed them to get high-ranking positions in uh, the National Socialist regime. So we find all kinds of linkages between the history of Namibia, National Socialism, and even further uh, into the shared story of apartheid, um, and even further into the present. I would like to remind you that some of the racist terrorists um, that have been uncovered to work in Germany had received training 
in, on German farms in what is today Namibia. So we are talking about traditions, racist traditions, that have continuities to this very day. And we should not make the mistake to believe that these are traditions that are somehow uh, you know, neatly packaged on the far right. No. As I said, in terms of the symbolic space we share, in terms of even the cultural policy of our country, Germany in this case, we are all part, we are all enmeshed in this present where the violence of the past continues. And that is why I believe um, having a shift of perspective in public commemoration and arguing even about this helps us to bring forth a different perspective, the perspective that we will talk about at this conference to re-enable us to cast a better glance and become aware of our shared responsibility. And once we become aware, the only way for us to move forward is to listen to people such as the activists that we are honored to have here and then think very deeply about what is our individual and collective role in bringing about restorative justice. Because what we're talking about is an imbalance, an imbalance that has not been restored. And unfortunately for us that we live here, we benefit of this imbalance every day. So the question is, what is it that we are going to do so that we ensure that we are the last generation to benefit from this imbalance? Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. And uh, then I would like to give you the word, Esther. Thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I really think I have nothing left to say because the former speakers said everything that I wanted to say. Nevertheless, post-colonial memory culture and restorative justice, why today? And my brother from Cameroon, and I want to say my brother, because one history that you don't know is that Herero and Nama people in 1904-1908 were also shipped to Togo and Cameroon. So it might be that we somehow we have a similar blood lineage that we are not aware of. Um, why today? For something that happened 114 years ago. There are few reasons why today. We need to talk about the past in order to make sense of the current. We need to talk about the past to liberate ourselves from the past. And after we liberate ourselves from the past, we move on. Most importantly, we need to talk about the past, not to repeat the mistakes of the past. Now, why today? After the extermination orders, the Herero and Nama people were incarcerated in concentration camps until the 28th of May, 1908. When they were released, they were looking like walking skeletons. Like in the book of um, Sylvester and Gewalt, these people were saying, and I want to quote, there were only a few thousands of us left and we were walking skeletons. The people died like flies that had been poisoned. This picture, you are very far, you don't see it. We are talking about people who were walking skeletons. And just immediately after they were released, Britain or the British took over 
through the League of Nations. The pain, the wounds were suppressed because there was another colony. And in 1921, officially, Namibia became a fifth colony of South Africa. That was another apartheid system. So when did these people have time to talk about their pain? There was no time because they were under another colony and their focus was on liberating the country, fighting for the freedom of Namibia. Eventually, on the 21 of March, 1991, 1990, Namibia became free. At last, we could say, we are free. But unfortunately, and that is very, very unfortunately, Namibia never had the truth, the TRC, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, like in South Africa, where people could get a chance to ventilate, express their pain. We were very stupid then, because our government was blinding us with the so-called policy of national reconciliation. We were told, forget about the past, we are free now, we need to move on. And we thought it's true. 13 years later, the wound was still there. It was never healed. It's like conflict, which is boiling down there, and on the surface, you think everything is okay, but it explodes the one or the other time. 2003, that volcano exploded, and the Herero people said, by 2004, the extermination order of Fontrota would mark 100 years. It's time for us as a community to come together. And since then, we started to talk about our history. That is the reason why today. Um, today is very important. We just heard that we have enmeshed history. We know what happened in Zimbabwe with the land issue. Two weeks ago, or three weeks ago or so, the South African Parliament passed a motion that they will pass a law to expropriate land without compensation. Zimbabwe is not far from Namibia. South Africa is not far from Namibia. What, what is happening now in South Africa might happen in Namibia as well. We don't want that because we know what happened with expropriation of land without compensation. We know the destruction that was brought by that in Zimbabwe. We don't want to see that in Namibia. Germany should be smart enough not to be seen causing another destruction in Namibia. That is where we are saying, while you have people like Chief uh, Kuopa, who are still in a position and wanting to talk, German government should do that. Because the younger generation might not be as understanding as our generation now. And if things get out of hand, it will not be good for Namibia and Germany as well. When people start grabbing land, expropriate farms, there will be instability in Namibia. Germany already is sitting with a problem of people coming from Syria and elsewhere. Where would we run to if Namibia also become unstable? 
we were told we were once subjects of Germany. We will run to Berlin. <laughs> Would you also be able to deal with us coming in again, like the rest of the others from the rest of the parts of the world? So I think today and now is the time to ensure restorative justice to prevent unnecessary disruptions. I thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Esther, and to all of you. It's already so much to talk and think about. Um, but as this panel runs under the question, why today, I'm now tempted to ask you how today. And you already talked about the different perspectives, the different works you're engaged in, in your um, different areas, in your different countries, cities. Um, Yes, and I would just like to ask you if you can give some concrete examples how you're doing this work. We already heard so much, but just to dive a little bit deeper into it and also hear the concrete obstacles and possibilities you face. And I would give you the floor to start. Who would feel like it? Um, memorial memorialization for us is something very important. Um, we have identified very important historical sites, uh, sites that were battle sites. We have identified important days. And every time in a year, we come together as a community to reflect on our history, to keep the memory of that history. And those are days such as the 12th of January, the 9th of April, the 11th of August, that is Ohamakari, that everyone knows very well. The 2nd of October, when we go to a place called Odombudo Vintimba, and we commemorate and remember our people who died at the hill when for, where von Trotter stood when he was reading the extermination order. And that is important for us as a community. It's part of healing their wounds. Uh, 2011, for example, when the skulls for the first time were repatriated back home, we put up a tent at that place. And uh, in our culture, we have a very special way of mourning. The women will gather in a house, and they will cry. But that cry is like uh, praising the dead ones for their bravery and um, manhood and womenhood and everything. And um, you would not believe me that 2011 people literally cried as they were imagining the return of those skulls. The how, the how is, is very simple. We have been talking about the how since we arrived in Hamburg. The how is German government sit with the representatives of the Nama and Herero people, talk to them, negotiate with them. It's not impossible, it's very possible, because you did that um, when you negotiated with the Jewish and the State of Israel. You signed Protocol 1 with the State of Israel and Protocol 2 with the uh, communities. Do the same with us. Sign protocol, whatever you call it, with the Namibian government. And sign another protocol with us. We, I don't know what the Namibian government will put on the table. 
but we will know what we will put on the table because of the extermination order and the intent to wipe us off the face of this world. Thank you very much. Um, you said something very interesting. Um, it is very, very important that we should also look at our individual roles we have to play. That is where it starts. So whenever I am talking to um, the civil society members of the government, from, uh, from my point of view, of, uh, from my job, I always tell them, ask yourself what you have to do as an individual. And sometimes you just have to educate people. Sometimes you have to explain to people. Memory is taught knowledge based on experience of the past. So, and we have to process this now in the right direction. So every one of us can do something about it. Um, what I find here very disturbing is also the fact that uh, I, when I grew up in Cameroon, they used to say, he who wears the shoes knows where it pinches, okay? So if we have a family of five people and one person have, has a shoe and is hurting and you want to solve that person's problem, you don't go and ask the sister, which you cannot solve. The, the sister may say it is the left toe. You go and get a shoe with space for the left toe. It comes back. You will not solve the problem properly. So that is where we have to see what can be done to get those involved, those concerned. We, we, have, we have had a lot of difficulty with talking about a people instead of talking with the people. That is where international politics has failed and failed, and we are still not learning. So I think in that area, that something has to be done. From my own point, I also see the generations here very, very concerned. That's why you, you, another point which you mentioned, unfortunately, in Cameroon, the, ed the system of education which is there was put in place by the colonialists. We grow up learning about European history, not even knowing our own history. And then when I came here, nothing is said about those people. Nothing is said about, so there is a very, very twisted educational system which we have to correct. And that is why I think each one of us can do something because when you go to schools, to university, you talk about colonialism. It's like, what is that? So many German students don't even know that Germany was a colonial master, let alone. And then you go to streets, you see streets like streets of uh, von uh, Trotham. And I had a short discussion with one of the participants in the uh, meeting at the uh, city hall today. And he was saying that we should actually, he is against the fact that we must do something against that. But he is not satisfied with the approach of taking off the names because it takes it off and we think that we have done something and it's over, which is also a very positive way of seeing it. But I was trying to say that at the same time, when I see the name on the street, it tells me they're paying homage, honor to somebody. Mm -hmm. So we must do something against it. And that, so when I, th I want us to, each one of us to look at our responsibility. How can I help you, help you, which position, what can I do? It might be just enough by sensitizing people, organizing small meetings. One, so somebody said in the past when we had meetings on topics like this, we had just few people. Today we have hundreds. That encourages me. So we have to keep on doing it, each one of us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. OK. History is one of the most important weapons that we use today and wanted to and shall also achieve what we want. But those years, history was not teach in the right way, in the truth way, what has happened. 
but we learn history from our grandparents. Grandparents who could tell us what has happened. And even as our great grandparents who was also involved in the history. You know, that way we can, like in my case, I can talk about and read about Timothy Sneeuwer. He's my great, great grandfather. That is. But as we are going on, it comes that you will just hear about South Africa, but not deep of South Africa because it was the time of, of South Africa. Yes, I wanted to come to the time that we was fighting for the liberation of the country. The country must get free. And it was also worth whatever it cost. After the country got free, then I want to come special to myself. It is that I remember what our great grandparents have told us. I remember about the different traditional leaders who have, you know, the, when, when, when the chiefs was killed, shooted, uh, shoot you know, which they have that in remembrance and, and, and have those, those days, the years, like even up to now. From we the Bondelswats, we are also on the 25th of this, uh, uh, October, uh, 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 October in, of 1903, uh, where our chief was also being shot at, dead to death. Yes, it remains in my mind. And immediately after independence, 1990, where it comes up to me, it is now the time to talk about the truth, and the truth must set us free. It is where, as I have stated and said it, I organized a group that was the genocide, so that we can talk about. The first letter to wrote to my president at that time, Sam Noyoma. When I speak this, that was one of the things that they have never thought about. It will come out. There's nothing that I can say that was the answer from his side. But the body language, the body language to his wife have made me understand that she is coming up with something. That is based why I'm bringing this up on why today. To make it very clear, it was immediately after independence from side of the Namas. 1992, 1992, 14 May. It is where the Namibia Duchess Tuftu, who also was having a, a meeting, gathering on cultural events, and I was invited there. But then I said to them, there's no way that we can talk about cultural events. After all, your great-grandparents have killed our great-grandparents. So there's no way that we can talk about cultural programs. It's the time that we must come together. Your ancestors killed our ancestors. Let's come in and talk. And I remember they were scratching their head because they couldn't believe, you know, immediately after independence, that a person come up to that. That is one of the things that, why do they, it was already immediately after independence, that some of us have started it already. 1999, I call all the traditional leaders together. Those who are the swapos didn't turn up. Bread and butter. They didn't turn up. But the oppositions have turned up, which I was very glad for. And we spoke. And they know. But they went back and keep quiet until 2006. Lucky enough that I was in parliament. And when late chief Kaimo Rirwako brought the motion up in parliament, that I could have opened my mouth on behalf of the Namas. Because late Kaimo chief Rirwako, let his soul rest in peace, just spoke about the Hereros. And if I was not there, then there wouldn't be anything recorded on behalf of the Namas. That is how we can talk about Nama and Herero 
which happens at that time. Why do they? It is that. It may think that we have kept quiet for all a long time, and now it is maybe that we want just money. But it doesn't go for the money. Money is the second thing. The most important part, it is that those bones, those remains, I remember it lay scattered there in Luderich. It is down, it's just like stump millies, if you know what is sent. It lays there. It is a pity for myself even that I didn't put it on something, you know, where I could throw, put it on out PowerPoints. I hope the next time I will do that. That is that we have not kept quiet. We are still busy. We run around. In Luderitz, the road construction dig all the graves out. It was just there. What happened? Late Chief David Friedrichs at least could get people together and get all those bones out. The government don't want to be involved in maybe a government. They were not there. They were not there. Then he took out 24 big black bags, 24 big bags of bones so that we can bury them, rebury them again. Then, government don't want to help with coffins, with nothing. And he asked me, why today we are still doing the things af from af immediately after independence that 11 coffins I could got, and we reburied dead bones. At that day, it was only Chief Friedrichs who was there, together with me and some committee members. That is, we rebury them. After all, we wait for four years. No one was willing to come in and to help so that we can put a monument on that grave. There was no one, no angular chief even, who was willing to do that. I paid 61000 out of my pocket. Other committee member, 5,000. Other one, 2,000. 68,000. We put a monument on it. On that grave. So what I wanted to bring under your attention, why today? It was not only today, but we are coming a long way of to settle all these things. So that we can say also to our people, when it happens that all the remains, the skulls, the Bible of Hendrik Wettboy, the papers, all those, can go back to Namibia. And we can rebury it, our people, and say, let their soul rest in peace. There's nothing now at the moment. They are still waiting and depending on us, the generation to do something for them. Then comes the round table. Then comes the round table where we wanted to tell the Germans that that is what we want from you. And you have to pay it. Not compensation, but reparation. I thank you. Thank you very much for this. I think it's a very important perspective that's often not seen how much history lies behind this fight. Okay, when there's no question from the audience at the moment, I would um, just like to give the word to Crazy and then close the panel after this. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, um, after the important points that we have just heard, invite um, members of the audience who are you know, based in Germany to um, look at the current moment here and ask the question, you know, why 
today and you know what is happening in Germany today and uh, what should we maybe do about it and I want to draw your attention to a few things um, one is the contrast between what we have just heard where um, even to erect a memorial for those um, you know murdered um, is something where no money was available other than f of course what the committee raised themselves I want to remind again everybody who pays taxes in this country that um, you and we, I also pay, we are paying for a, 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 um, a cultural monument that will cost several hundred million euros. This is the most expensive cultural project in all of Europe. And I'm talking, of course, about Humboldt Forum. And I want to remind you of the fact that this is not only a shrine of looted art, okay? It's not only the place where more than half a million objects, many of them looted, uh, during colonial times are going to be housed. But I want to remind you of the fact that the organization responsible for the Humboldt Forum, the Foundation for Prussian Cultural Heritage, and I say it again in German, the Stiftung Preußischer Kulturbesitz, is the nominal organization responsible for the upkeep of the skulls that were brought to Germany in the context of the genocide in Namibia. So how then is it that we are sponsoring a shrine for looted art in the hundreds of millions and are unable to ensure that once, of course, research into provenience, where the stuff is actually looted from, is conducted. But then, of course, on the other hand, how can we ensure that some of that money is actually spent on researching into the skulls, doing what I believe the committee has asked Germany to do, which is conduct forensic analysis into the skulls for people to better understand the history and maybe the circumstances of the death of you know um, those people. And then of course also to have a dignified return uh, of these objects. That would be um, one aspect. Another aspect I want to raise is we heard here several times mention of chiefs. And I want to remind the audience that in Namibia, chiefs um, have a constitutional role. I mean, they are part of the state apparatus, okay? Um, and I'm mentioning this because it seems that Germany is very willing to nitpick and to choose whom they want to be in touch with. Yes. And I want to remind everybody that if you look at the map of Africa and of Namibia, you see a border that was largely agreed in Berlin. So that means the whole shape and frame of Namibian statehood, of course, it has been won again, you know, there has been, independence has been fought for, but uh, the frame of many of these things has been designed in Germany. And if we come to a deeper understanding of the Berlin Conference of 1884-85, I think we must understand that it is illegitimate for the German government of today to now come and choose and say, okay, you know, we have designed the borders and now we are also going to choose whom we're going to talk to and whom we're not going to talk to. It is part of, uh, part of Germany's and therefore all of ours post-colonial responsibility to ensure that these dynamics do not continue. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for this. Um, as a closing question, and then we can also go into break earlier, because I think it's well deserved. We have all a very long day behind us. Um, and my closing question is a question that we as the organizing committee organized ourselves very often because we often ask our, ourselves what can this conference do? What can it not do and where does it even fail to reach its aims to um, support the over Herrera and Nama, Nama people in their fight for justice and to fight for a post-colonial memory culture in Germany. So perhaps we, because we had many discussions about it, 
um, in in really detailed ways, like where do we want to have our conference, where do we not want to have our conference, from who whom do we want to take money, which money do we not want, and really general discussions. Perhaps I want to give this question to you to hear your perspective on this, if it's okay for you. Um, you know, I said already our appreciation to the organizers of this conference because from our side, the OGF, we have four pillars that guide us in our work. One is awareness creation and education, which is, of course, ongoing. Um, the second one is to solicit support uh, locally, regionally, and internationally, and also to find ways to exert pressure on the German government to talk to us. And then, of course, the issue of memorialization and monuments. And those four pillars are interrelated. You do one, it speaks to the other one. Now, this conference already is helping us in one or two of our objectives awareness creation and uh, education. And I'm sure that through the work that you are doing since we arrived yesterday, I'm sure that we have educated more people in Hamburg. And why is it important? It's important because the 200 people that are in r this room today will surely go out and they will also spread the word and so education is being spread and it's ongoing. So you are doing a, uh, a very good job in this area. And also creating platforms where we can come and, and, and you know, raise our voices. That's, that is important. So what can you do? This is what you are doing. And uh, it means a lot to us. Um, it's, it's solidarity that we are gaining. We have built and um, established relationships with many civil societies, not only in Berlin, but now also in Hamburg, in other countries such as France, the US, and so on. So this is very important, and I think you are a group of young people doing a very good job, really. Mm. Es, es ist alles gesagt worden, es ist super. Und äh, wir in Berlin werden wir auch unseren Beitrag leisten. Und äh, wir sind auf einer Mission. Unsere Aufgabe ist, euch zu überzeugen über unsere Arbeit, über was die Herreros noch damals äh, erlebt haben. Damals. Und ist, wir sind wirklich sehr dankbar, für diese großartige Arbeit, die ihr geleistet habt, und äh, wir sind mit euch. Thank you very much. Yes. What the Hereros said, it is what the Namas said. And therefore, I don't want to repeat what my two colleagues have said already. And I believe also the other two will also just say the same. <laughs> Therefore, let me just say it also. Thank you. Thank you very much for all the good works that you are doing here in Hamburg as well in Berlin and all over the country. We will copy. We will copy this best, these good things, still with our ears, still with our eyes, and just go and do the best they are at home. Thank you very much. Continue with the good work. Okay. It seems like I have enough time now to yeah. talk. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm very, very grateful to be here today. Um, we 
talk, we walk with facts, and we talk and try to prove with science. At the end of the day, we are humans. Passion, love is important. And that is what we need. Not just saying it, but sharing it. And it takes love to do what you are doing. And that is why I appreciate it very much. And I'm so happy that I was able to make it to come today. I'm very, very happy about that. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Miriam, for the conversation, the exchange. And now, regarding your question as to what can be done, you have to intensify this. You have to continue. It is very important for the awareness. And maybe we have to reflect on um, what is the next step beyond just sensitizing people. How can we mobilize? What are the other options? Maybe we can prepare a petition and have many of these people sign it with some of the facts that are there. I always like when I go to a meeting, I say, what was the result of that meeting? So we think maybe it is possible to prepare a petition and have all of us here are multipliers. It means that each one of us will sensitize 10 more people to sign. The 10 more people will sensitize another 10. Um, when sometimes we are talking about difficulties, people will say, oh, Joe, it is like a drop of water on a very hot stone. And I say, OK, then make it millions of drops. Yeah. OK, so um, we have to not give up, continue, and um, from my own part, like uh, from Engagement Global, maybe we have to discuss and see what are the other options we have in order to carry, up, carry on with this sensitization process, with this awareness process. And also we have to watch our tongue. And also sometimes somebody may say something to you and it will give you the opportunity to explain things to that person. Now, I, talk, uh, I talked about superior Europe mentality to the so-called inferior African mentality. Um, and um, most of the time, I wanted to bring a traditional chief from Cameroon to give a talk here on leadership. And everybody in our church, I mean the Catholic church and uh, very active in, the, in our parish, say, oh, the Häuptling comes. Um, Häuptling is a German word. Haupt is main. But the moment you say Ling, mm -hmm. it diminishes. Mm -hmm. It's like, um, uh, and they say that to every African leader. Mm -hmm. uh, the moment they, they say, ah, the Häuptling. And it also, so when I get, when somebody just say that, I use that to explain. It's not a Häuptling. Mm -hmm. That's the leader. A traditional leader, like you have your princes and queens in Europe, so you don't call it a hoipling. And it, is, it brings awareness. We need to start somewhere. So I have told you we will have to talk and look at where we can find some points to do that. And please, let's appeal to emotion. Let's appeal to humanity, to feelings. Because um, if we don't do it, populists will do it and the wrong way. Um, <laughs> We have talked about, um, when I th w w the last statement, when I was talking with the person I met today, it was a very interesting conversation. Um, no, it was with uh, one of my former stu students in Bremen. We talked about emotions and say, but we have to work based on facts and science. And so I said, but Joe, in politics, it's emotions, and emotions decide. It is not because emotion is wrong. It is because emotion is important because we are human. So let's appeal to emotions for the mistakes of the past to correct the future. And it means that all of us should look at what we can do, what is our responsibility. Thank you so much. And I will do what I can on my part. And I hope every one of us will do what he can on his or her part. Thank you. Maybe just to um, echo this suggestion and make it a bit more concrete. Maybe, and this might have already been on the plans, but maybe there could be like a confl conference declaration or resolution that uh, you know uh, you could come up with, and then that we, as you know, participants in the conference, could sign, right? So that we, um, you know, 
uh, and it's something that we can also pass on. We can invite more people to sign so that the important perspective that we have now been privy of to hearing on this podium and what will come in the conference, you know, will uh, spread further out. And then also, uh, we will, you know, um, as people who are here, as people who may be voters here, you know, um, sign this and therefore underwrite it with our names, with our convictions to show that, yes, this is something we support. And I believe that this is important because I think we should make no mistake about it. We are in a political moment where revisionism is on the rise, where we have um, elements in the official opposition party in this country who uh, are very busy revising the story of colonialism. And we also have new movements that connect around the world, around the Western world, about ideas of, and I will say it, of white supremacy. White supremacy is the underlying ideology of this genocide, and it's the underlying ideology of colonialism, of national socialism, and this is something that is gaining strength again. Uh, and I do believe that it is important um, for us to shore up a version of history that is not diluted, that is not cherry-picked, that is not distorted. And I believe we need to defend it with reason and with heart. And so I believe certain gestures are important, and I think such a resolution could be such a gesture um, for us to make it clear that we see the current developments and we stand together to ensure that we're not backsliding into an era of new revisionism, but rather um, listen to these voices and amplify them here to move forward into a future of shared responsibility. Yeah, yeah thank you for um yeah, for this panel, and also we will take the suggestion, suggestions that you gave with us and see what we can do until tomorrow. Um, before I give the micro to um, my moderation partners, Josie and Tom, I would just like to thank you, everybody, and hope you can enjoy the sun. No. But one quick announcement by Tom before you leave the room. Erstmal herzlichen Dank für diese sehr spannende erste Panel-Diskussion. Bevor ihr und Sie jetzt den Raum hier verlassen, würden wir uns sehr freuen, wenn Sie am Eingang Ihre E-Mail-Adressen, insofern auch gewünscht, auch weitere Kontaktdaten hinterlassen. Denn wie gerade ja richtigerweise angesprochen worden ist, soll ja eine Petition auf den Weg gebracht werden. Und dafür ist es, glaube ich, wichtig, damit es kraftvoll ist, dass möglichst alle, die auch das Bedürfnis haben, das zu unterstützen, ähm, gebündelt und gesammelt werden. Von daher gesehen würden wir ausdrücklich darum bitten, am Eingang ähm, liegt eine Liste aus, dort einfach die Kontaktdaten, die hinterlassen werden sollen, zu hinterlassen, dass wir entsprechend das bündeln können und so dann eine Petition auf den Weg bringen können. Vielen Dank.